Yeah, we got power. I don't know what that one is. Good morning, everybody. Why don't we call this meeting uh, to order here? Beautiful spring day here in the Rockies, so uh, it's really great to see everybody again. Uh, I'm uh, happy to be back, and I, I thank B for doing such a wonderful job and was not here last month. So uh, let's start with introductions. Uh, I'm Dave Betzler. I'm the chair of the Regional Advisory Council. I live up in Monument, so I represent the North End Tri Lakes uh, Monument area. And if we have uh, microphones here, so make sure that we uh, tip the microphone switch when you get a chance to speak. B. B. Babbitt, Northern El Paso County. Uh, Chris Larson, Park County. Joyce Whittle, Park County. Dixie Herring, Colorado Springs. Are the lights going on? I can't tell. Uh, Earl Parks, Zeller County. Yeah, it's on now. Jen Nemo, Colorado Community Health Alliance. Thomas Huggins, Eastern El Paso. Dixie Wodell, Southern El Paso. Joe Urban, Area Agency on Aging. Uh, thank you very much, members. And I uh, will ask the audience uh, to introduce themselves as well. Lucy just coming in in the back. Another member has just arrived, Lucy Crandall. Lucy Crandall, Seniors Blue Book. Lucy Crandall, Seniors Blue Book. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, uh, again, thank you, thank you, everybody, for being here and uh, for participating in the Regional Advisory Council. We do have a quorum. Uh, the next order of business, then, is the consent items, and we have the agenda before us. Are there any changes or adjustments that need to be made to that agenda? Hearing none, we'll move on to the next consent item would be the minutes. Hopefully we've had, we didn't get a, uh, were there a copy of minutes? There, there, there was email. They emailed it. So people had a chance to look at the minutes. Any changes or recommend, recommended uh, modifications to the minutes? If not, as a consent item, will somebody, yes? I have a request, um, is that, uh, um, I personally, I don't know if anybody else uh, uh, has this problem, but I cannot print um, on any emails. And so I can read through the emails, yeah. but I'd like to have a copy of it. And I don't know if there's any resolution to that or not. That, that's an easy one, Joyce. We can, um, we can make a couple copies. Uh -huh. Folks, when they when they come in, we we obviously we're trying not to kill too many kill trees, too but many but trees. people that we know in advance, that's very easy to do. Sure. Okay, I would like to request one. Okay, thank you. All those in favor for consent items from approving the uh, agenda in the minutes? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Perfect. We'll pass that one. Now we're into public comments. This would be beyond the rack members. Public comments. The second button to the right. I think the one with the smiley face. Smiley face. Smiley face. <laughs> oh, I see. There you go. Perfect. Well, um, first, thank you, Rack, for uh, allowing for public comments. And I first want to thank whoever uh, got my uh, eyeglass case. Thank you. It was the first purchase I made at Silver Key's thrift store. So <laughs> when I lost it, I was really sad. <laughs> and then when it was there, I was like, oh, my gosh, we are destined to be together. Um, but but I, that wasn't the comment I actually wanted to make. What I wanted to make was that we have our annual, first annual, um, a fundraiser, friendraiser 
event on May 8th, which is called Engaged at Every Age, and it's going to be at the Antlers. And I would certainly like to invite everybody from the rack to attend and anybody from the, uh, from the public that wants to attend as well. I'll leave my card over at the table if you're interested. Uh, please let me know. And in the uh, April meeting, I'll bring um, actual flyers for, okay. for that notification. So hopefully to see you all at that again, April 8th, 1130 at Antlers, and my card will be at the back. All right, thanks. thanks, Jason. Other public comments? Hearing none, we're then uh, moving uh, speedily on to the information items. So the first provider presentation we have scheduled is Invita Cares. That would be, I think Dave is going to talk to us this morning. Morning. First of all, I, one of the things that I, again, I'm going to press something. You got to get the red light on. <clears throat> I'm on. Okay. When I do these presentations, I often forget absolutely the most important thing, and that is to say thank you. Uh, what we do, we could not do. Uh, the amount of impact that we have, our reach, uh, the visions that we have for reaching this community would not be possible without the support of this committee uh, and PPACG. So thank you. There we go. That's good. Um, most of you are familiar with what transportation means. I'm going to gloss over some of the high-level stuff on what we do because uh, some of it is more intuitive, and I want to spend this presentation today talking more about what we hope to do, a little bit more on the vision side because I think that might be more engaging and more exciting to find out what it is that we want to do in the community and what we can do with more resources. Uh, we are transportation. When you look at our um, mission here to promote access and support independent living with dignity, it's both transportation and home care. We do in-home support services as well. Both of these programs help people remain independent in their homes where they want to age, where they want to be, um, fulfilling their desire to uh, be at home. Our transportation services are focused on older adults, those with disabilities, and those who are economically disadvantaged. We do a lot of Medicaid. Um, serving the Pikes Peak region for nearly 48 years. Um, and we were AmbliCab, for those of you who don't remember that name, we were AmbliCab for most of that history. And we rebranded a little over a year ago because AmbliCab was too restrictive a name. We wanted to make sure that we were encompassing our vision to help people live independently. So we chose the new name in Vida, which means together in life. Forty percent of our riders are older adults. Uh, last year, PPACG had a little bit more limited funding. As we know, the funding cycle went a little, a little bit differently last year than it has. Um, and so only 15 percent of our rides were AAA. This year, we're we have really grown that. We're providing close to 400 or more AAA rides per month. And so thank you very much for the increase in funding this year. It's meant a world of difference to our riders. One of the exciting things we, we have done this past year, and most of you are already aware, is opening a route to eastern El Paso County doing public transit. The picture there on the route, uh, on the right, um, came from a rider who took that picture on her cell phone and sent it to me to say thank you. She was so excited that the bus pulled up to her house on the plains and took her into the Silver Sneakers program at the Briargate Y and back. And she was so excited. This is an older adult who is deaf. She, can only, she communicates with us by text. Uh, so she's not able to, she doesn't want to call in on the phone because she can't hear anything. Um, but she is, I'm on regular text with this woman, and she takes the bus about two times a week now. She'll go to Walmart, she'll go to the bank, and she goes to Silver Sneakers. And uh, she has been going out onto Facebook. She's been sending out notices, telling everybody out in the community that this has changed her life. And so that's just been a wonderful story. Um, recently, we have expanded this route. Just um, as of March 16th, we expanded the route from two days a week to four days a week. 
and we went from twice a day to three times a day and doubled our ridership. So that's been very exciting to see the response from the community. As I said, we also do in-home support services. This is under Medicaid. They do reimburse us under the Home and Community-Based Services Waiver for in-home support services. That means that through what they call consumer-directed support, the term for people who receive services, they use the term consumers. Other people might say patients or clients, but they use the term consumer. And these are activities for daily living. All these acronyms are Medicaid acronyms. So that's why we use them here. Activities for daily living are ADLs. And so that means personal care, homemaker services, home maintenance, protective oversight. So that's what we do there. And we currently have about 100 consumers with family caregivers in this model as a part of our program. Um, in, for our transportation, we are currently serving El Paso County. But for this program, we have been given the jurisdiction of a seven-county area, El Paso, Teller, Pueblo Park, Fremont, Otero, and Crowley. Right now, we're in El Paso and Teller. About a quarter of our folks are up in Teller. And we are talking to DHS and other organizations in the other counties to expand our services there. So, what's next? This is where I want to slow down a little bit to talk about our vision, because I think it's really critical. When we started with our vision of opening a public transit route to eastern El Paso County and, and to um, really engage and um, touch the lives of older adults, in particular out in the rural El Paso County, when we did our study, we, there are only two major access roads out east. One is Highway 24, and one is Highway 94. So we started with 24, but that doesn't mean we've lost sight of 94. And so we really want to get out to Ellicott, Yoder, and Rush, because they're too far away from Highway 24 for us to really reach them with that initial route. We need to establish a second route in order to get out to Ellicott, Yoder, and Rush. It may look a little bit different than our one going out to Calhan. With Calhan, we're using a 10-passenger bus with a deviated fixed route, which means we have specific bus stops. Going out to Ellicott, Yoder, and Rush, um, we'll have to, to really talk to the residents out there, but what I suspect we'll initially do is do more of on-demand. When people need rides, we'll figure out what we can do on kind of a per diem basis to get out there and pick people up and bring them in. So it might start off a little different until we're able to build demand. Uh, some of you may not have heard of the term MAS, M-A-A-S, Mobility as a Service. This is a term that's being used in transportation circles to talk about how transportation links up from one community or one region to another. Um, as you can imagine, we've been given jurisdiction right now for El Paso County. Teller Senior Services works in Teller. Somebody else will work down in Pueblo. But if you need a ride from one county to another, you need to be able to cross the county line. Just because our funding stops doesn't mean your need for a ride stops at the county line. How do we coordinate? How can we come up with a single payer system to help a rider get across county lines to, for example, to come into El Paso County for behavioral health or a medical appointment when they've been referred to a specialist or any number of things that you're gonna find in an urban area like Colorado Springs but they have limited access to in Teller or Park or Pueblo or go out to Crowley. Think of some of these outlying areas. They don't have all the services all the time that they need. So we are, our vision is to truly link up with folks like Teller Senior Coalition. And we had a wonderful visit with them recently to say what can we do to make this work. So this is our vision. We're not quite there yet but we want to get there. We read things like the tip and the step 
and the four-year plans. We read those things. We understand what the vision is from bodies like this and at the state level when they talk about reaching rural, when they talk about reaching uh, communities that are underserved. And it takes providers with the vision to step up and make it happen. And so we have to work together and then come back to you with our plan in order to make that happen. And so that's what we're working on. We're also, um, we've applied for what's called a common carrier license with the Public Utilities Commission. That's a different type of transportation license that would enable us to serve hospitals, healthcare, and senior facilities. Why do we want to do that? Well, right now, uh, when we talk to folks like Aspen Point, um, when we talk to folks like um, Peak View Behavioral Health, they have needs for getting some of their behavioral health clients home. There's a 72-hour hold for behavioral health. And then these patients need to get home, and they have a series of follow-up visits that are recommended for them to come back for treatment. And getting those appointments lined up is very difficult. And so we want to have a license that would enable us to work directly with these facilities so that when they call and they need help, we can get there. Uh, and then from transportation, we want to expand our home care services with something that's called supportive living services. It's an SLS waiver, also under Medicaid, but it means we can help those with intellectual and development, developmental disabilities. This has been a particular need um, <clears throat> in um, different communities in the area. And right now, our HCBS license uh, does not enable us to, to really serve that community as well as this supportive living services waiver would. And so we're trying to expand that service. So that's kind of our vision for how we could expand our services and truly meet the needs of the residents of El Paso County even better and to help people age and live the way they want. Any questions? Yes. I don't know that it's a question. Uh, we met at the provider meeting, and you and your company, I've spoke with Trudy many times, have just jumped on board with helping us expand transportation and home care in our area. It's been weekly, sometimes twice weekly phone calls. They're already working on financing specific to the east of Kenosha Pass, and it's just been amazing how much I've jumped on that. Thank you very much. You're welcome. You're welcome. It's. We have to keep working on this vision to make it happen, but I think we can get there. We just have to continue to work the numbers and talk and figure out how we can make it. Yeah. Yes. So, today, um, um, so for the SLS, is that more for the brain injury waiver, or are you thinking more of the DD, developmental, or does it cover both? I think it covers both. It's intellectual and developmental disabilities. Because it's actually um, a brain injury. I just was curious. Brain injury, we currently do. You know what? I would have to find out for I you. I just was curious. I'm not sure what which waiver the brain injury falls under. Well, okay. So I was just was curious because I know that, again, finding those services and having mm -hmm. them be available in their home. Yeah. Is, so having the, the, having the distinction for the one waiver may allow you to do it. And yeah. other as well, not just the DD. Right. We're trying to expand to get all the different waivers under Medicaid for the family caregiver model. That's what we're looking at right now. Um, and then from here, we'll look at um, what other services we might be able to expand to. But right now, there's still, there's still bandwidth under that family caregiver model. So to your point, where does brain injury fall? I'll find out. I think we're there, yeah. but I'm not sure. I, I can't confirm. I think the brain injury waiver kind of falls in line with the EBD waiver, which you probably... Which we have. Yeah. We do have EBD. Okay. Um, and then one other question. So uh, the, the home care services, those are under the family caregiver, so there's, mm -hmm. they're finding the, the person who's the caregiver, not as a staff person? The, the way that works, the way that works is under the Medicaid... Mm -hmm. Um, rather than a family member having to work two jobs to support somebody at their home who needs help, Medicaid will reimburse that family member 
to care for their loved one at okay, home. Okay, so it's a relative care provider. It's a relative okay. care provider or somebody that the consumer chooses. The reason I was asking is because the biggest issue with finding the resources in the outer areas is how do you find staff? Exactly. Which is why I was questioning that yes. part of it. So the beauty the of this. The consumer is finding mm -hmm. the, the worker, whether it's a family member or a neighbor. Exactly. But they're the ones finding, okay, because that's. Really and that's the huge. only way it's going to work because finding staff, because I exactly. tried, <laughs> is almost impossible, you know, in the, right. in the outer area. So excellent. Yes. Right. And so, and that is, but, you know, not everybody in rural areas qualifies for Medicaid either. And so you still have that need um, outside of the Medicaid model. But for the Medicaid model, this works very well in rural areas because they can choose a family member or somebody of their choice. Yeah. Yes. So if someone doesn't have Medicaid or wouldn't qualify for it, then home care, am I understanding it right, uh, wouldn't, be, uh, wouldn't be something that you would, they would be qualified for? Now you're getting beyond my area because we're limited right now to Medicaid. So I don't know Medicare. how, you yeah. are wanting to know how it works outside of Medicaid and I don't know. Okay, I meant Medicare. Oh, yeah, Medicare? I, I yeah, really we, don't, Medicare. we don't do Medicare right now, and I don't know if yeah. Medicare, that's, yeah. That was a mistake. We're not licensed for Medicare. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Joyce, yes. just, so you, just so you understand that, um, anything outside of Medicaid would be a private pay situation. Okay. And so someone who, again, it could be a neighbor or something like that who could come, but they'd have to pay them out of pocket I see. for that type of care. Medicare would pay for something if it was like physical therapy, occupational therapy, yeah. but as a medical aspect. But again, it goes back to is there staff available who would be able to go all the way out to do that, which is what puts such a huge um, hardship on those who are in those, those more rural areas because it's very difficult to find um, any kind of uh, 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 home care, home health company who can really support that on a regular basis exactly. because of the staffing. But outside of Medicaid, either it's skilled Medicare mm -hmm. or it's going to be a private pay out of pocket. Okay. So which is why this is such a huge help. Yeah. The, the other gap that, that we kind of fill in between there is the voucher program right. for anybody over 60. So. Right. Um, right. That that uh, it once again that's dependent upon providers as well. Yeah. Yeah. And and one of the things that we're looking at when we start looking at rural areas to provide the um, home care services is to identify a critical mass of folks that we could serve with home care that would justify having a vehicle out there that we could then provide transportation in that outlying area. And that particular model is one that we're, we're talking with folks in Park County about right now to give them some assistance. Other comments or reactions? Joe? No. I'm okay. Just turn on your mic. Okay. Uh, I'd just like to say, too, I think that uh, it's important. You mentioned at the outset that you're looking at other plans as well, like the four-year plan and the stack and the, the other types of uh, advisory committees that are looking at future needs and future capabilities. I think it's really important that you're doing that, but I also think it's really key that the four-year plan here that's just been uh, produced really is hopefully uh, laying out those future areas to focus on. Exactly. We want alignment. That's right. I think that's really an important piece, and I think it's really uh, exactly what the uh, temporary subcommittee that we have, I think that's, that's kind of why it's, it's been created. Exactly. To be able to look at the future things, somewhat a little bit different perspective perhaps, and provide an assist to the AAA staff as they actually develop and then publish that uh, four-year plan. So it's, it's really an, uh, sort of a hand-in-hand -hand type mm -hmm. evolution here, and it's using the expertise and the backgrounds of the people within the RAC. So I think it's, it's a really good thing. Mm -hmm. And I applaud NVIDIA for doing this, this innovative stuff. I think this is the, exactly the type of stuff that needs to get uh, looked at, and then as the progress is made, it's really important to have publicity on that, not mm -hmm. only in this type of a forum, but more broadly, mm -hmm. so that people begin to realize, hey, this is really a, a significant area and a significant step forward. Yeah. Just a, a personal example, uh, the uh, 
church pianist, organist, who is supremely talented, uh, and she and her husband, a daughter lives with her, granddaughter lives with her. She's been fine, but now she has some uh, uh, medical uh, uh, hip issues. So she went into the hospital for a while, now she's in rehab, but it's that transportation piece, even though it's private pay. Yeah. I mean, you have to figure out how you're going to do yeah. that. So this is a huge service. Well, and, and can I say that we don't make these decisions in a vacuum. Um, we talk with folks here at the RAC. Um, you know, when we talk about Eastern El Paso County, we talk to folks like Phyllis. Um, when we talk about reaching out into rural areas, we talk to the folks in Park County. When we were developing our whole plan for coordinated MOS transportation, we had Jason DeBueno working with us on, on helping develop that plan. So uh, we, we met with folks in Teller. Um, so this is, I guess part of it is to let you know that we're all working together behind the scenes, talking with one another to make this happen. Yes, ma'am. Uh, two statements specifically in regard to the uh, four-year plan. When we took it back to Bailey area, which is Grant, Shawnee, Harris Park, Burland, um, one of the things that they seemed very happy about, which was a very significant point, was that they promised to police it semi-annually and annually, as in verify that the goals are is goal-oriented, the path is being addressed, and they're working towards that path, which is wonderful. And then as far as your company goes um, and publicity, Trudy has already agreed to come and speak with our group and hopefully in connection also with the senior coalition at one time. And then we've already got the flume and mountain connection willing to come and do an article about that. So that's great. it'll get rocking and rolling. Great. That's good. Thank Chris, I'm glad, I'm glad you brought that up because that's one of the goals um, of the four-year plan and, and even <clears throat> above that, the PPACG strategic plan is that it doesn't be a it doesn't become a paperweight that sits paperweight. on a, on a shelf somewhere that that it is reviewed on a, a at least an annual basis, if not semi-annual basis, to to make sure that we're getting things done. And uh, last night I heard Andy report to the Citizens Advisory Committee for the PPACG uh, the quarterly update on on what's going on with the PPACG plan, and and I know this committee is committed to making that a dynamic document. Yeah. Phyllis. Yes, the biggest thing that Dave's problem has been is the education of the people out there. Uh, <laughs> <clears throat> because they uh, say well, they're afraid that they're not going to pick them up. For an example. Well, they're, or they're afraid that when they get into town, they're going to get back. abandoned and they're going to not be able to get back. And this so has, this has been a quite a chore for him. Yeah. In the aspect of the people out there and understanding as to where he's coming from. Yeah, we do trainings on what it means to, to take more. public transit. I think a lot of folks have watched too many movies <laughs> where they've seen public transit and it looks really scary. And when you've got third and fourth generation folks on the planes that don't know what transportation means, they have these preconceived notions that that's really scary. So we've been going out and doing what we call show and tells. And we take the bus out, we get people to sit on the bus, we talk about the route, and we tell them what, when they come into town, if we know they need a return trip, we write down their mobile phone number. And if they're not at the bus stop, our driver calls them and says, where are you and are you okay? And we make sure that they're taken care of because we don't want to leave anybody behind. The biggest thing about it is 24 is a lot different than 94. Yes, it is. And you are, <laughs> trust me when I tell you that you're going to have a bigger problem in trying to explain to them because they're so spread out yes. more. You're going down 24, you got a place to meet. Yes. Whereas these people are in 10 buck two here coming in. Yep. And you have to find it, and to go and get them is a lot more expensive than trying to get a stop. Yeah. Somewhere. Yeah. Phyllis, we'll I think that. you need to go and be the show and tell and ride along on the bus with them and, and reassure them that you. Ah, I know. <laughs> yeah. But, but I think. Uh, listen, we go different places twice a month at least when yeah. I see him. Yeah. And no, and I, I say. I'm trying to explain to these people, and I'm going, hmm. I say it jokingly, but I do think that obviously the influence that 
the council has had and specifically Phyllis's input as far mm -hmm. as how you've designed the routes right. has been very instrumental. But I think um, to have anything be successful, it, it, you have to have that kind of input. And so oh, yeah. when you go into it, you already know this might be a little bit of a speed bump here. Um, and so that's going to really the advantage is that you're going to be able to be successful in it because you, it's not coming out of left field and it's not going to be a surprise. Mm -hmm. So I'm just, right. I'm grateful to know and have seen that communication and that, that following through and, and actually taking the advice. I mean, we would all love to have that kind of influence and see positive things happening because of what our information has been to our providers. And so well, thank you for listening. Is you bet, long you bet. Story. <laughs> and I can tell you, and Phyllis would know this as well, it's not about building the route and they will come. <laughs> it doesn't happen that way. It really doesn't because when you're going out into communities where they think, oh, you're Colorado Springs, it's about building trust and relationship. Yes. And it's about showing that you're in it for the long haul and that you care, and it's also about convincing them that this is theirs and they own it, not us. And so it has to be something that they embrace and they believe in in order for it to work. And so building those relationships with folks out there has been critical. I just wanted to, a, a last comment I guess would be a, a piggybacking on the relationship. That's really key. And maybe in some of the rural areas, if there were a way that you could perhaps work with established organizations, which have a body of people, a congregation, so to speak, already, you know, through the churches. That's what we do. Through the churches. Yeah. yeah. And try to get the pastors, and maybe they can be, be the ones that... Oh, yes. We're, we're, the talking ones we're talking to pastors. We're talking to Lions Club. We're That's talking great. to Senior Lunch, Super. Eastern Plains Medical Clinic. Town Hall, uh, let's see, Dollar General, Dollar Store, um, 21 different disparate locations just last week. Great. Well, thank you very much. That's just on 24. <laughs> yeah. So, no, we're, we, we've got them all. Okay. Thank you very much, everybody. A very positive report on this. Okay, and the next one on the uh, provider presentation is Area Agency on Aging. Okay, right. Um, good, good morning, I'm Gretchen Bricker. I'm supervisor of the direct services team here at the Area Agency on Aging. Um, Dave did a good little presentation on part of the reason that it's so important to people, or not part of the reason, part of the solution for people who are really wanting to remain in their homes, stay as independent as possible. But we're feeling a little niche for those folks that aren't on Medicaid. <clears throat> that little niche is in regard to, we, we do provide vouchers for folks that are low income, uh, that uh, the vouchers are for both homemaker services and personal care services. So in order to remain independent in your home, some of those, those simple housekeeping um, items tend to be a little overwhelming for some, for some of those, those folks, and they can't afford to pay private pay costs for those services. So we have a voucher program that provides <coughs> limited hours. We are not going to be the agency to keep people um, that <coughs> might require a higher <coughs> level of care and a lot of, of services that might be otherwise provided by the HCBS program, Home and Community-Based Services Program through Medicaid, but we'll provide some limited services to just support their being able to remain independent in their home. Um, the the um, homemaker program, uh, we have an intake process that they describe what their functioning level is, they describe some of their income, um, issues and then we will be able to determine based on a formulary that we have how many hours we can offer them for these homemaker services. Homemaker services would include light housekeeping, laundry, ser laundry, linen changes, cleaning the bathroom, uh, vacuuming. And, you know, vacuuming I think becomes probably when and cleaning the bathroom is probably the, one of the most difficult things for those folks to be able to 
uh, really do a, a, a decent and thorough job on. But Lighthouse Keeping Services is provided uh, with us determining how many hours we're going to be able to offer. And this is um, hours within a month. Uh, they have to call back every month if they continue to want the service. Um, we talk a little bit about whether if there's any changes in their in, in their situation. Maybe they've gone to the hospital. Uh, they they need just a little more assistance for maybe a couple of months, a couple of, of weeks. Uh, we might be able to raise those hours, but then we also know that that's not going to be. You know, we're not going to continue. We'll go back down, depending on what their functioning is. Every year. We do a face-to-face -face where sometimes over the phone you don't get a really good picture of their functioning status. And so face-to-face -face will give us a lot better idea of whether or not we do need to continue the level of services or maybe increase them a little bit. Um, so that, that's the little niche that we're in. Those people that don't qualify for Medicaid but yet want to stay independent and are low income. The personal care uh, is the same thing. If they are needing a little bit of assistance with maybe supervision, with bathing, uh, maybe doing uh, some more uh, personal type care, washing their hair, whatever the case may be, we can offer hours for that too. Um, and along with, oh, okay, and along with that, we also provide what we call the uh, reassurance program. That's a lifeline. That might be actually the only service that they need. They're pretty independent, but yet there are some, they sometimes can be a little bit isolated or their family doesn't live in the community. Um, they, and they just need to have the reassurance that if something should happen to them, if they should fall, if they should get themselves in a predicament, that they've got the lifeline that they can use in order to contact somebody that they've identified to come check on them or perhaps even send some emergency services. So the lifeline is something that uh, we, we too offer and we do, you know, do a, a you know, to keep in mind their income uh, so that we are following our mission which is providing services to folks that are uh, rural, low income and, and a minority. So we, we, we do those assessments as well for that reassurance program. I, is everybody familiar with what a lifeline is? I think most people are. Oh, okay. Well, thank you. Um, it's the necklace. It's either a necklace or a bracelet that you wear around your neck, and if and if it's a button that's attached to your landline or maybe your cell phone, that if you push the button, it will automatically contact a uh, the lifeline company. We use uh, uh, it's it's called Lifeline of Colorado Springs is our contracted provider. It will contact them, and they will. There, there's a base unit that speaks to them to see if maybe it was accident or or is there services that you need, and what what do you feel you want us to do? Call call the contact or call the emergency service so someone can come to the home check on you. So it's uh, <coughs> one one provider in particular. Mm -hmm. okay. Right, and we and we and we provide those services in El Paso and Teller County. Okay. Just taken. Not hard. Not hard. I have ADT. Very, very similar. Similar system. thing. Yeah. Very similar. But the, our lifeline is a voucher, so it, there's no cost to them. Okay. And and the same with the uh, homemaker and personal care vouchers. There's no cost to them. But you're not providing staff. You're just providing the vouchers, and the staff is still up to the individual. Correct. Okay. Yeah, it, 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 we provide the vouchers, and the uh, the organization Lifeline of Colorado Springs provides the equipment and the monitoring. Okay. The install, and if there's any kind of. Issues. There really isn't much in the way of staff. It's mm -hmm. once it's installed, it just operates 24/7. No, until I, I actually, I'm sorry, I misstated myself in reference to the personal care and the homemaker. That's also based oh. on vouchers and correct the actual staff is provided by the individual and or by the people. well actually that's through a home health care agency they okay. will we have a contract a list of contracted uh, per providers that are uh, we contract with and so the actual client themselves will pick which agency they want to use okay. and then they we they work with that. there's actually two systems for and we operate both of them within uh, our region there's the voucher program that's uh, utilizes predominantly Colorado Springs and Teller where there are plenty of providers but if I'm not mistaken I think Park also has a voucher program 
which is called client. Yes. Yeah. Right. And, and, and I think they're actually looking at a client-directed program that would be similar to transportation. Yeah. And, and if somebody wants to know the difference between client choice and client directed, that's a whole one hour <laughs> deal. We'll talk about later. Well, we're just running into that. I'm sorry, fellas. We're you just running into that. Uh, are they, do they call you Put the lifeline saying uh, are mm -hmm. yeah. eligible? Do they do oh, that? No, no. Um, they, it, it's by Because I've gotten several calls about the lifeline. You're eligible for this yeah. and that. That's what I thought. Yeah, yeah. But they don't I call didn't you. Think they, I didn't think they did, but I have gotten the calls in that aspect. Right. Uh, I, the ref they come from outside of the referral sources. The, the, the client themselves will call and say they're interested in a lifeline. We do an assessment to you know just kind of determine that they may they qualify for the the program we want to make sure it's for those folks that are um, not necessarily total how do you say if they're still working if they're still driving if they're still very independent um, I want that we we want that particular lifeline if at all possible to go to someone who might be a little less more at risk at, in their home um, but we we can't deny anybody. We will not deny anybody services. Um, well, I understand as long that, as we have funding. I'm talking so. about the scams and stuff that they're yeah, having. No, with we're, these they're, they're not contacting. No. Okay. It's coming through our agency. So there currently is not a provider list through your actual organization end of it for Park County. You don't have a provider list. Not not for the reassurance program, okay. and not for the um, voucher, the no, homemakers. Sure. Okay. It's a provider issue. It yeah. is. Yeah. There's, there's, yeah, it's difficult well, to find well, providers up there. Gretchen, um, can, does your lifeline now work with both um, uh, regular phones and cell phones? No, um, our voucher program will cover the cost for a landline. You can get cell phone service, but you will be paying a small portion of that uh, that service cost. The cell phones are a little, the mobile cell phones are a little bit more expensive. You, you also have the option for the GPS program, but again, that's going to be a, an additional cost. But we'll pay the initial okay, so. or the, the cost for the landline okay. service. Other comments or questions? Yes, ma'am. Well, it depends on whether or not um, it depends on whether or not there's a, a, a wait list. Or, well, now we don't have one right now, so that's that wouldn't be an issue. It just depends on getting that information to uh, Colorado Springs and Lifeline of Colorado Springs and their time frame. And I've never found it to be very long. And so they actually come up to Colorado mm -hmm. and they will install it. And this is a button. It's not like. No, yeah, no. There are there are those kinds too. Yes, you can pay additional for those, but this is specifically a button, and the button is at it only it only really um, covers within your home. It will not cover outside of the home at all. It's mostly in the home and maybe a few. Roma, do you know how, what the the actual? Yeah. Right. Yeah. So it's not something that, if you're out in the community, that you're going to have that kind of response. But it's will be within the home. They they've and been so. very responsive, Kathy, in terms of getting them in quick. I know mm -hmm. when uh, Prospect was managing, I think 30 some of them yeah. in Teller County, and then they transitioned over to to um, to us, right. and they I think they did all those installs inside of a week. Yeah, all 35 was, of them. They did a really good mm -hmm. job. That's huge. That's very nice. So you're telling me that if something happens, say I'm out in the field, but I'm not at my home, does it work there? No. No. You have to be inside the house? You should 300 foot three. radius from the base unit. <laughs> yeah, there's so a base unit. It depends on what your house is made of. Right. There yeah. Are right. There are limitations, right? That, I mean, you can be standing right outside and it still won't pick yeah. it up just because of whatever's in the wall. Yeah. 
Other questions, comments? I, I had one more thing. Yes, ma'am. I also wanted to share, say that uh, my case managers also provide eligibility information and application assistance for those who may qualify for long-term care or the Medicare savings programs. And that would then tie up, and then Rome will talk a little bit about that. I might, uh, I might add that um, I'm aware <laughs> that um, <clears throat> Different providers are different as far as their receptibility. Um, like, for instance, you can take uh, this is limited, as you were saying, asking about, as far as how far, you mm -hmm. know, it will receive. Um, there's others that you can take with you wherever you go. That's right. And you have that option to do that, but the voucher program we'll only only pays for that basic in-home in -home. line. You can pay the additional uh, through through Colorado Street, Lifeline of Colorado Springs. So we can be piggyback. In other words, they can engage that service, and then the additional basic ones y'all pay, they can pay out. Correct. Yeah, you can pay privately for that. Well, and just as an add on, and Gretchen was saying, um, when Joe and I had our home care business, we actually were a provider of the ADT personal yes. emergency response units. So um, I, I think as far as those who were in Colorado Springs, in El Paso County, and, and their, their square footage of their home and the area outside their home, you're going to be within your area that the base is going to cover it. But like what Phyllis is asking questions about, as well as you, as, um, as well, Joyce, is the fact that that um, for those who are rural and you out on you are out in the you know in the garden or you're out you know you know within your property, um, there are other options. Yeah. yeah there you know there, so there's opportunities to be able to use that a different way. What I think is is um, one of the benefits of having a contract as a provider with Lifeline for you know for the area agency and aging is that there's someone that they've vetted. They know that they're doing a good job. It's something that you can know that they're safe um, as far as uh, doing business with them, but then to be able to go above and beyond, say, okay, well, this is the part that they'd be willing to cover, but I could cover the rest of myself. Mm -hmm. That's still going to be less than $10 more each month for just you. That's a significant <clears throat> savings. Um, but I do think that knowing that there's someone that they've gone through, they've worked with that person, they've They've agreed to certain conditions because their subcontractor is is a nice added thing. Um, but I think as far as the needs for those who are more rural, the, the individual in-home base unit this may not be enough because that's not where they fall. Right. Uh -huh. Yeah. It's out on the pathway mm -hmm. or somewhere outside the house. So right. it's very helpful. Any other, any other questions, comments? <laughs> Thank you, Gretchen. I think it's been very helpful and uh, informative. I might make a general comment. We have um, several in-house programs, so we've kind of taken the option of uh, breaking those up so that you don't get hit with five or six programs all at once. So today, um, Gretchen's presenting on the, on the case management side. Uh, Roma is going to talk a little bit about the uh, state health insurance program, the SHIP program, and the Medicare counseling that we do. And then later on in the year, we'll, we'll get a presentation from Kent Matthews about the caregiver program and Scott about the ombudsman program and Lucy about the information and assistance program that we offer. Okay. So I think you're up, Mama. Good morning. So my name is Roma. I am with the um, Area Agency on Aging, but I am the uh, coordinator for the SHIP and SMP program here within the agency, which is the State Health Insurance Assistance Program, the Medicare Counseling and Education um, Program funded through the uh, Division of Insurance and through CMS, or actually through administration of for community living. Um, I was going to talk a little bit more today about the SMP program. It's one of our uh, lesser known programs, which is the Senior Medicare Patrol. The Senior Medicare Patrol is the program that helps educate people on fraud and abuse and um, 
helps people when they believe they've been a victim of fraud or abuse related to Medicare or Medicaid. That is a small component of the SHIP counseling that we do for Medicare in general, but the S&P program um, is a, funding, a, funding, a funded program that wants us to focus on education um, of the community on fraud and abuse issues um, related to their health insurance with Medicare and Medicaid. We are trying to work very hard in reaching out to the community in different ways to find ways to engage the community and make this a topic of interest. It's hard to get people interested in something like this, but it is one of the programs that the federal government does have the most expectation that we are reaching out to the community to try and educate and assist people who may have been a victim of fraud or abuse. We also educate on marketing um, and sales tactics of insurance products and Medicare related products. Um, but again, it, unless it's something that is affecting you directly, it's not really a topic that most people want to talk about or hear about or sit and listen about. So um, <coughs> we, we work very hard to find strategies to try and find ways to engage the community and help them um, make this an important factor because this is something that absolutely could affect anybody and everybody at any time. It's it's a broad subject. We can um, help people when there are, are issues with a bill. If you think you got a medical bill and you shouldn't have, that falls under under this um, SMP grant funding. If you think that you were sold something, you thought it was one thing, but when you got it, it was something else as far as an insurance product, that would be also under this grant. So. It can, it can cover a broad range of topics. It wouldn't necessarily be just somebody stole my identity necessarily. Um, it can be as, as minimal or as minor as, you know, you think you shouldn't have gotten a, a medical bill, but um, we are always looking for volunteers for this program as well. One of the funnest projects of this program is secret shopping, where a volunteer is trained and then goes out and listens to presentations that are put on um, by other other agents or brokers or financial planners to make sure that they are presenting information in an appropriate way when it comes to presenting information to Medicare beneficiaries or their family members. What if they don't? If they don't, if they are not doing it. If you got your secret shopper out there, they're doing something wrong, then what? Where does it go from there? So once we've identified the problem, our primary goal is to educate. And so we would reach out to that, that specific person doing the presentation and try and educate them on, on what we feel may not be appropriate. If the behavior continues, then we absolutely would um, file a complaint with the Division of Insurance and the um, Department of Regulatory Agencies. And it could go all the way up to, at, some, at one point, if it continues to be an issue, the state will yank their, their agent license. So we definitely... Um, that's a good question. <laughs> Unfortunately, don't know don't know, right? we don't know what we don't know, and that's part of the part of the challenge that we have is we don't have um, enough manpower to really to really put forth as much as we would like to, because there are more of them than there are of us, and we just don't have the capacity to to see them all. Yes, ma'am. So back piggyback on what she said. So if somebody goes to a seminar and they're getting incorrect information, uh, this person that is doing the presentation gets talked to, but what about the people that got the incorrect information? How did they get re-educated? So if, if the secret shopper is, because the secret shopper would be trained and, and have the knowledge um, about what, what is and is not accurate, um, sometimes that can be accomplished by simply bringing that information up during the presentation, asking a question. So if they're, if they're being told one thing, the secret shopper can pipe up and say, well, I thought it was the other way, and try and get them to identify that misinformation right then and there. Um, otherwise, you know, it would be difficult, depending, it would depend on the degree of misinformation, 
um, but usually it's something that would try and be ad addressed during that presentation just by asking a question usually and that's where the education piece comes in the training so if we invited a presentation that we feel is Absolutely. Okay. You're more than welcome to. There's a how do we see those presentations all the time? Like, um, that's wrong. I'm calling Roma. Well, absolutely. We are the we are the S M P um, office for the same nine counties that we do the ship counseling for. There's also a toll free statewide um, number that anybody can call. Um, they absolutely, anytime there's even a suspicion that there might be misinformation or something just not right, if you call us or if you call the state's office, um, somebody will look into it. It's not going to just get lost in cyberspace. Can I ask a question as far as general advertising? Let's say you see something on television and they present it as a Medicaid, Medicare product, and they say you buy one of these scooters and you get a half price off a second scooter. Is that something that y'all can police? I'd like to say yes, but no. Okay. The and I and I know what you're talking about because I see commercials that are questionable all the time. The commercials that you see, the advertisement that you see, falls under a very gray area of the marketing communications policies that have recently been revised by CMS or Medicare. Um, that marketing slash communication slash education becomes a little grayer every year, which unfortunately makes our job a little more difficult um, in identifying what's appropriate and what's not. Um, but it would, if it, if it was blatantly incorrect, it wouldn't be on TV. So it's, it's, they're pushing the line probably, <laughs> but they're not doing anything that is actually policeable, so to speak, unfortunately. Chris, you hit on an important point because there's a lot of there's a lot of stuff that goes on that's in that gray area. It's legal, but it may not be extremely may ethical. Not, and, yeah, and and whether it's ethical or not is usually without question when you have a question about something like that. And like you said, Roma, too, that you're doing education and awareness and assistance, but you're not doing enforcement. Enforcement policing is a regulatory function, yeah. which comes under somebody else. So, so if you're it's an advisory a, if it's a, type of thing. If it's reported to us, we will do some investigating. Sure, and but it's if, not enforcement in no. a sense. You can, no. you can make a report. Here's, here's somebody yeah. else needs to do something about we that. We can take it to that level. We can right. put it to that level. A place to go to, to do that. Which Absolutely. Is, yeah. And we can help you. Sometimes when someone thinks there might be an issue, it may not be an issue. A billing issue may simply have been a, uh, a typing error on the billing department's part, um, which is easily correctable. It may not be intentionally um, billing somebody inappropriately. So we help identify whether or not it's, it's actually fraud or abuse or misinformation um, versus what is or isn't. And when it is appropriate, we will follow through on that and investigate a little bit more. And it is Medicaid and Medicare. Correct. The yeah. biggest thing that we see is an advocacy issue. You, somebody is paying cash for a medical procedure, and they're offered a cash discount for that medical procedure. Well, they go ahead and they get this medical procedure, and the next thing you know, they send, they get the EOB, and the EOB says. No, we're charging $1,200 for that procedure. No, I was told that it's only going to be $600 because I pay cash. Then it becomes a debate between the patient, the billing people that are doing the building, and then the insurance company, and then you need that person in the middle that says, yeah, that's not right. Let's, let's have a conversation. And that is something that I've seen a lot. So when it comes to Medicare and Medicaid, that is absolutely something the SHIP and the S&P program can help with. Um, there are many situations in, with Medicare in particular where that is not allowed to happen. So we are happy to help address those issues and, and try and work with those providers as well. There's a, lot, there's a lot of situations where lack of knowledge around a situation can be, can be you know, and knowledge can be filled by these folks, and it's, it's very simple stuff. I know one of the things we run into fairly frequently is there's a, lately a preponderance of organizations that will do quote Medicaid qualifications. They will fill out an app for you. They will help you walk you through the process, and then they'll charge you several thousand dollars to do that. Well, the bottom yeah. line is, if you walk through the store right here, we're going to do it for free. Free. Mm -hmm. And and 
probably as good a job, if not better. See, there should be a place, special place in hell for people that take advantage of people. <laughs> <laughs> well, Actually, I'm, I'm going to put a little caveat on that. <laughs> yes, that's absolutely true. But having done Medicaid applications myself for many years, there are applications that are simple, and there's applications that are literally from hell themselves. <laughs> so there is, there is a, I think, a scale that tips one way or the other. And um, I personally have had situations where people have had real estate, situations where the house was falling down around their ears, and yet they, there was no way that they were going to be able to um, <clears throat> um, sell that home for the market value which is required under the Medicaid guidelines because it wasn't worth anything. <laughs> and in those sort of situations, I would say that as long as it's a reasonable fee, let somebody else who is a professional do that because I'm unaware, but are you a real estate professional, Roma? <laughs> I am not. So I, I think you have to look at what the situation is. If it's a standard, simple you know, application and the financial background of that individual is relatively normal, then I think absolutely there's no need when you have the quality professionals here with all the other opportunities that not just with the application being filled out, but also double checking that their Medicare um, is the appropriate plan and all these other things and the case management that they all provide. But there are some that have financial situations that aren't bad, but they are complicated and it can get very sticky. Um, and if it's done incorrectly for any, any reason, it can become a real problem for them down the road. That is a responsibility and a liability that <laughs> I don't think this office wants to take on. Yeah. But so it, has, it depends. If it's, it, it, I really think that you have to be, look at what their situation is and taking on that responsibility can be, um, can be difficult all around. Well, I ran across a case in Montana outside of Targi where we, I was interviewing for a home health care service to manage the practice in Bozeman. And we went and saw a couple that lived in a, a mobile home that they'd added some additions to. You walked in the door, the sweetest little couple in the world. You walked in the door, they had a little entryway, and you see two recliners sitting there with a little table between. And on the other side of the room, probably as far as that screen, they had a large TV. But as you walk further into the house, the entire center of their house was a hole. Oh. It had already gone, it had fallen down. And at some point in them applying for aid, apparently they'd been approached by the ski resort to purchase their property. Mm -hmm. And they had decided they did not want to, in their old age, relocate, have their, sell their property. They had one nephew that lived somewhere in Timbuktu. And long story short, they ended up getting in trouble because they did not take an asset and acclimate it to a cash variable. And so somebody else was judging the fact that they really don't, shouldn't have accessibility because they're sitting on a cash cow and they're choosing not to utilize that. And how that got through paperwork, I have no <coughs> idea. Yeah, that's when you say, I'm paying somebody to do that. <laughs> that's pretty hard. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah so, yeah. Very, oh. very too hard oh. Yeah. yeah Any other uh, comments or uh, suggestions on Roma? I, again, I think it's been very worthwhile to uh, get this type of presentation. Thank you for it. Really an expert. We do have some examples of some of the, um, the flyers. These are placemats that we take to lunch sites. Um, yeah, see To just try and... And, and I like these because people can take them home with them. You know. Are these accessible? Can I get more of these? Absolutely. You must have one of the smaller cards. You put it in the pocket. Because this they're just going to throw it away. Yeah, it's too big. Try it. That was a very specific number. That's awesome. Yes, it was. <laughs> That's funny. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
All right, we're uh, moving uh, rapidly through the uh, today's agenda, and now we're on to the uh, AAA director's report. Over to Joe. Um, got a few things. This is generally a really active time of year for us relative to state legislation, and there's a lot churning right now, but there's nothing really that has come to the surface, so I'm not going to even highlight uh, any of the state bills. The session has roughly another month left in it, and... Um, I suspect there'll be a lot that happens between now and, and the end of the session. I um, wanted to start off by thanking the folks that uh, assisted with the four-year plan, the, the committee that did that. Jen was on it. Jody Barker was on it. B was on it. Dave attended as well. Did I miss anybody in that list? I think that's the primary group. Um, they put a, a lot of hours into it. It's a great product. Um, Dave signed off on it this morning. That was the last thing I needed, so it gets buttoned up and sent to the state of Colorado this afternoon, hopefully. Um, and Melissa helped a lot with that, too. I should not leave her out. If she had not come on board when she did, I would be working on this till midnight tonight. You wouldn't have any hair left. And I, wouldn't have, I, I don't have much hair now. Um, I also want to uh, thank the folks that helped with the TRS, that helped with that mini RFP process that we just completed. That was approved by the board at their last meeting. Both of these were approved by the board at their last meeting. Um, so, so Dixie, you should take a breath and pretend like four months has passed because we're getting ready to head into the next cycle. Um, th we got together yesterday and established a timeline for that. So I'll be talking to you and, and the members of the committee to see what's reasonable for a, a meeting date in there. We're going to try to issue that RFP in about a week and a half and then give the providers uh, at least two, two and a half weeks to, to get their stuff together. They, they knew it was coming, but uh, at, we're hoping for a norm, normal year. Let me put it that way. That's the, the best I can say. There, the, it, not lately. There is not such a thing. It's a new no. normal all the time. The new, yeah, we're in the new norm. Um, the uh, ENT series, which uh, some of you are familiar with, it's a, it's a program that... Um, involves uh, a series of classes and Melissa do you want to talk to speak to that sure. it's, it's coming up we're getting ready to start it so uh, some of you guys I see picked up the blue flyer kind of at the door there and so just a reminder the first class happens next week uh, and so if you have an opportunity and can share with folks um, about the class uh, I'll tell you a little bit more so the ENT retirement series is also a connection with the Pikes Peak Library District as well and basically they're a series of one, two, three, four, five, six different classes during April. And so folks who are in retirement or thinking about going into retirement might really benefit from attending the classes. And the one that's happening next week is on Social Security. So for people who have questions or are wondering, you know, should I retire early or, you know, anything that's going through their mind around Social Security would be a great class to attend. Um, we do have one... Um, up in Cascade at the U Pass Library, uh, and then we have them here at the Pikes Peak Area Council of Governments. And so, again, just if you have an opportunity and can pick one of these up and spread the word around for folks that you know um, here and just a little bit up the pass, we greatly appreciate it. And hopefully, someday we'll have some things going in Park County that we can partner with you guys as well on. So, that's what we wanted to get out there. Thanks. All right. Um, those classes, uh, in particular the Social Security one, is actually taught by the Social Security Administration, so you're getting all your information straight from the horse's mouth. It's a, it's a great opportunity to, to get good information. Um, as many of you know, Senior Day at the Capitol was canceled, uh, probably one of the best decisions that was ever made. That was the day of the bomb cyclone. <laughs> and you, would, you would probably still be in Denver had you gone up for that event. Um, they have rescheduled that for April the 11th, um, and that information is on the Colorado Senior Lobby website, so if you're interested in that, it's, it's a similar format. They've moved it. Uh, they, it wasn't going to be in the Capitol anyway. It was going to be in uh, the consistory there, but that is booked, so they have moved it across the street to First Baptist Church, which is where they have done the lunches in the past. If you've ever been up there before, the lunch last year was, was at the church, so they're going to do the whole event there. Um, and actually, with that kind of date, we may even get a little bit better um, participation from from the legislators. We'll see. It kind of depends on what's uh, what's on the docket for uh, bills. And then the last thing I wanted to talk about is 
we're heading into the beginning of the Older American Act reauthorization at the national level. Uh, we had the opportunity yesterday afternoon, all the directors in Colorado had the opportunity to get on the line with um, the offices of Senator Bennett and Senator Gardner. Uh, as we head into that reauthorization, they are looking that neither one of them are on a committee that, that governs the initial parts of that uh, authorization but they do have input to put in once that process gets going. So we were able to kind of throw in our two cents worth as far as what we thought were the most important things relative to that. So you should see, should start seeing some publicity or some information coming out. I would imagine in the next couple of months, the, the process starts with the committee looking at what hearings need to be set relative to the specifics of the authorization. And then the vote itself, we anticipate probably sometime in the midsummer area. We're very much hoping that they do a, a little bit longer authorization. It's traditionally five years or six years. They're hoping for six years this time around. Last time it was three. So um, we, we want to get to a point where we can uh, have a little bit more stability with, with what's going on. And uh, one of the major requests of the Colorado delegation was that they give us a little bit more flexibility in terms of how we can spend our money. Um, Federal money is so siloed in terms of where each little piece can be spent, and there's a big difference between Park County and downtown Colorado Springs, and we'd like to have the ability, and, and Dr. Cog and Grand Junction, for that matter, Denver and, and uh, rural areas. So we'd like to have a little bit more flexibility in terms of where that money goes to meet the greatest need. Anybody have any questions for me on anything? Will there be any a question on the four-year plan? Will there be anything besides saying we've received it at the state level? Will uh, they look at it? That's a great question. Provide feedback or anything else on that four-year plan? Um, or how, how does it relate to the other uh, AAAs that are pro producing? The I same suspect thing? what will happen to the, the state itself is required to synthesize this information, put it together into a, a larger four-year plan, which they've already done quite a bit of work on, and then they have to submit that to the administration on community living, which is part of Health and Human Services by July 1, I believe. So when that when their report comes out, we'll be able to see how our component pieces fit into that. And I'm sure they'd be happy to answer questions on that as well if we had questions. Okay. We could probably, as a matter of fact, if, if need be, we could probably uh, mic them into one of these meetings if, if that was uh, if we needed requested. That. Sure. Yeah, I guess it, it just pointing out, too, that, okay, so we put together or the AAA has put together then the four-year plan for our region, if you will, that goes to the state level. Now they're going to slice and dice it and package it together, and then it goes on to the federal level. So, I mean, that's that's the sequence that we're on. So it really points out that the work that's being done in our assistance for the AAA really does make a difference. It does get filtered, and whether or not it actually results in something in the federal legislation or federal uh, regulatory uh, effort is sort of questionable, but nonetheless, we have that opportunity to <coughs> influence it. And I think there's there's two component parts there. There's the part that we're required to do, which is submitted to the state, um, and then there's the local component, and, that, and that's where the committee and the work that's done here to ensure that that's a dynamic document, that's where that becomes kind of important, is that we keep looking at it and, and tweaking it and making sure we're doing what we said we were going to do. Super. Yes, Chris? Is there some uh, that's probably the wrong word. Some way, if we get response back from the federal government in regard to something that's been submitted all the way from a regional level, is there some forum that we can say, hey, wait a minute, can we give you some feedback? Uh, that's a great question. I, I don't know. This is my first time through the process, so I don't know if, if, there, uh, if the ACL actually asks for feedback once um, all the reports are entered, but I can certainly find that out. And again, that's ACL. Is this uh, ACL is Administration for Community Living. So and it's under DHS. Yeah, I wish I had a whiteboard. Um, <laughs> uh, H Health and Human Services is a department under the executive branch. So they report to the president. ACL Administration for Community Living is one of the branches of Health and Human Services, and that is what all of the state units on aging report to. They report to the ACL, and that's where their money comes through, is the Administration for Community Living. Would you mind putting that in a type format so I can sure. have that? Sure, absolutely. Thank you. I can give you the whole hierarchy. I've got a lovely little graph that's extremely busy. <laughs> <laughs> it's bigger than this. <laughs> that would be great to see. I'll, I'll bring that next time. And
Bring your magnifying glasses. <laughs> okay, anything else for uh, the director? Uh, thanks, Joe. So from, uh, from my perspective as the, as the chair, first I'd like to again thank uh, B for being the, the chair when, in my absence last, uh, last month and uh, also to the members of the subcommittee that worked on the four-year plan and to Dixie and the TRS group that worked on that uh, budget-related stuff. Really important that, uh, again, I think it's really to use the talents of the, of the council rather than just the same, same uh, drill that we go through. It's like there's a lot of talent out here. So we're trying to reach out and trying to make sure that we tap into that. Uh, so what did Dave do last week when he wasn't here? Okay, so my wife and I went down to a meeting in Durango, two-day meeting for uh, fire, or excuse me, fire Adapted Communities, FAC Colorado. And this is part of a uh, sort of a national, loosely a federation, if you will, of organizations that are trying to improve the uh, forest health uh, and also community resilience and mitigate uh, the wildfire threat or the risk. So this uh, two-day conference, we got to see two different uh, HOAs. One was a very rural one on 13 to 30 acres, and the other one was on 900 acres, 100 homes. So you get a different perspective on what people are doing to mitigate the threat, what they have done, what they are doing, and their plans for moving ahead. So it was very helpful for that. There were people from uh, Washington State, Wisconsin, Minnesota, Texas, Arizona, New Mexico, and Colorado. I think that's, that's the group. About 30 of us. Uh, so it was very worthwhile. And the reason I, I kind of am really focused on that is not only because I live up in a uh, wildland urban interface, a WUI. <laughs> WUI. It's a very popular term within the whole uh, bureaucracies that deal with fires and emergencies. And wooey means you got lots of trees and you got lots of understory, scrub oak and stuff like that, and, and it's waiting for a match to light it off. And that's what would happen in California, that's Waldo Canyon, that's Black Forest, not so much Black Forest, but Waldo Canyon for sure, and, and California, and up in this area. So we're really trying to focus on that. And I think that the, the real key in the intersection here with this focus on seniors and the elderly really is that regardless of where you live, Regardless of where you live, do you know the neighbors? Do you know the seniors that are there? Are they spouse? Are they temporarily uh, limited in physical mobility because of a fall or you know whatever it may be? Do they have relatives in the area? It's really, really important in the emergency preparedness sense of, of where we live that we are conscious of and aware of and actually working with individuals around us. And to get that word out is really, really important. Just like we've heard in all the presentations this morning, it's important to go out and do that networking, that outreach to let people know, hey, this is a concern. This is something you got to think about. Uh, and again, so it's, it's, it's just one of those things that's on my, uh, my backpack that I carry around. And it's, it's a passion of mine, just like working with the seniors here. We really got to be very, very uh, aware of that. One, one other sort of connection on that is that working in the wildfire sense, I'm working with the Tri Lakes Monument Fire, Depo Fire District, and they handle pretty much the northern end of El Paso County. Well, guess, guess who actually gets to go out and go to those homes where there might be a senior or a couple that are pretty frail or have limitations and they can't do things on their own? It's the fire department. But because of HIPAA, in many instances, they cannot pass that information on. But from the local neighborhood or HOA or whatever the jurisdiction is, it would really, really be helpful if somehow the knowledge that, okay, the fire department has gone to Mr. Smith's house and Mrs. Jones's houses seven times in the last month for recurring types of issues, which means it's not really an emergency. It's, it's, it's an assurance or reassurance almost to that family. But it would be nice to know if that, if that general information you got person over here in this area and one over here. If the neighbors were aware of that, maybe they could engage. So that's one of those things that's really, really important. I think it's probably critical in the rural areas. Yes, it is. And that's interesting. You just addressed a point. We actually, <laughs> number one, we did a thing called Fire Adapted Bailey. We can't get the seniors to come forward, but we actually raised $50,000, uh, which is incredible, and it was matched. The other, comp <laughs> the other component of that is we have designed 
those of us in the, the Friends of Betty Seniors, we have designed a card with the fire department and the sheriff's department, and it has the numbers for the senior coalition. It has my personal number, and now what's happening is the firemen are going to go out, and they're going to hand these to anybody they go out on a transport and a non-transport call, hopefully eventually the sheriff's department. The goal is to make it statewide, and it's a matter of putting it in the seniors' hands. Here's an opportunity for you to connect, and we just literally did that. We yeah. got approval with the commissioners yesterday. Yeah, and it, that's a huge thing. It really is one of those things where you want that information available in, in every refrigerator, if you will, or whatever in each right. home, so that people understand that. In the, in the instance of uh, Tri Lakes area up there, <clears throat> it's uh, I pass the information on their AAA. You know, here's here's the you know basically the issues for that uh, that one particular family. They needed uh, counseling. They needed somebody to walk them through. What are the options? How do you deal with this? You had a, a spouse that was physically able and one that was not. Recurring problems with one of those people. So it's like okay, pass it to AAA and the, the senior hotline, so that then they can contact that individual rather than anybody else immediately. But. If the neighbors were aware of that, maybe there's something the neighbors could kind of ease that situation and make it a little bit more, more livable. So I'll, I'll stop on that on that uh, that note. Um, uh, Dave, just yes, in, in that line of thought, though, um, I don't know how long it's been since we have uh, Joe. Have we had the CARES program come and speak to this group. No, that'd be an excellent. But topic. because our Colorado Springs Fire Department has a phenomenal program. Jen and I mean we've been aware of it for many years in fact my husband was a part of it um, originally but it is exactly what you're talking about Dave where they actually have case managers as part of the fire department when they see the number of calls for one individual they actually can do that and it might be nice just to have them come as a speaker to give us an idea so that we can take that information and it. disseminate it out and, and they would be great. happy to do that yeah. they would be happy to do that I guess the other point uh, uh, just sort of Tying a couple things together, okay, so that's that's the fire department, that's fire adapted daily, or it's the fire wise, or whatever the organization is. It's it's a similar thing where you really have to make those connections across those communities. The group down in Durango was five counties, and they had a paid staff, and they had oh, a director, and they had two, three county am ambassadors. An ambassador workshop is what it was called, but they were out there trying to spread the word, educate, and support the individual leaders in those communities to uh, proselytize, if you will, uh, the firewise mitigation, the need for emergency contacts and all that kind of stuff. To me, what it points out is that what they did in that five county area is what needs to happen across El Paso County. Oh, go figure. You know, Tri Lakes is not really seen as part of the uh, stuff that's going on within the county and fire. So, I mean, there's, there's a whole bunch of different connections that have to be made, but it really just points out again that while well, I've been urging the need for neighbors to take care of neighbors and stuff like that. It's also across organizations that you have to be very focused on networking and sharing information in order to move the, move the ball forward. Um, I guess the, the only other thing I have is uh, focused on the temporary subcommittee, and I haven't had a chance to talk with Jen on this, but we had, I think at a previous meeting we had talked about potentially this is a subcommittee that is temporary at this point, which expires, I think we said, the end of June. So this would be one of those things where I'll, I'll, I'll give you a minute to think about it, but I'd like you to be able to say at some point down the road, maybe for the April meeting, is there a proposal to make it a permanent? And if so, what would that subcommittee be looking at? What types of things and how do we think we would uh, uh, stru structure it, if you will? I think that based on the earlier discussion here, the subcommittee, this temporary subcommittee was very helpful, very very uh, valuable in providing input to that four-year plan. So Jen, what, what are your thoughts on, on the subcommittee and, and where you think it may or may not go or should go? Well, Dave, I was thinking about that last week actually and wanted to propose that we as a subcommittee meet again Great before idea. April to brainstorm what that looks like and potentially ongoing meeting of a quarterly so that we would prepare to review the four-year plan with the strategic plan and, and how it's moving forward. Okay. And I think that part of that, that subcommittee also would be looking at other, potentially other things Absolutely. that could be looked at mm -hmm. or considered. Right. To consider other agenda items that could include like yeah. the CARES coming to do presentations for services yeah. that may have fallen outside of the realm of what we just look at from our specific group, but widen that lens per se. 
Yeah, and I, I think that that's uh, that would be very valuable to do that. Uh, Joe, any reactions great. No, to that? I think that's super. Yeah. Okay, Melissa, do you have any thoughts on the subcommittee? If you do, I mean that would be the thing to work with Jen on that, just to make sure that we're we're taking advantage of all the uh, the expertise and the, and the staff staff uh, backgrounds. Okay. Any other questions for me? Comments? Yes, ma'am. On ma your on your fire department <coughs> type thing, we we've, we've learned to we work with the sheriff, and they all have if they call twice. And it continues because we have so many seniors out there yeah. that that's how we get the information out is through the sheriff. But see, this is this is the sort of the point that I, uh, you know, just a reaction to that. It's like, okay, so our Trilex Fire Department. I mean, they're paid, they're paid uh, and well trained and very experienced. But I think that this issue about the elders that I was just related to you, I think, was sort of like, oh. Maybe we, they haven't really thought about it, perhaps. They've got really? lots of things on their plate, so it's a matter, again, of just you have to be that uh, uh, not angry voice, but you have to be a direct voice to say this is an issue, this is a concern, have you thought about, and then figure out is there a way to link them with others, the Colorado Springs CARES program or Silver Key and their uh, uh, counseling program, whatever it may be. It's really important that we become that broker of it's, information and get it moving across the various It's a community thing, though. Yeah, communities, too. Really, it's, uh, uh, we found that the best way to do, to get the information, is if you have several calls on a server, several mm -hmm. different places, that we have all the information, and that's gotten to us, yeah. you know, uh, through the sheriff or they give the information to the fire department. Yeah, there are, there are a number of different issues. You have the training of the fire department crews as well. They right. have to be aware that, okay, this is that information, whether it's a card or whether it's just a, exactly. an awareness. So, I mean, that's a lot of different pieces to it. Yes, ma'am. Well, one of the reasons why we try to initiate <coughs> the card idea was the biggest problem I think everybody has is getting the seniors to step forward, identify them, <laughs> find out what they need. And then aside from that, in Park County, or at least in the the, the Plaque Cane area, our fire department does not have the process, the ability with their software system to put in a, a repeat client. In other words, every time somebody calls in, they have to be put in from ground zero. So they don't have that accumulative ability to say, oh, this is a repeat offender. Yeah. We've seen them five times. Clearly there's an issue here. So it is a matter of that's a, a unique component of a rural fire area and the fact that we don't have that computer system to do it. So we're hoping the cards will be that step to the connection. And what we're really all talking about is the, the individual that really precipitates that, that, that right. you know, response. Right. And that's really why, from a senior perspective, we've got to have that in our mind when we talk to other people from other jurisdictions, other neighborhoods, other areas. Really important. There's another uh, question? Yes. It's, uh, Twice. I think that um, what Phyllis said, the sheriff really is probably the one that most commonly interacts with seniors um, do you think it depends on the area Tri Lakes Tri Lakes is a big area there are you know 40 or 40,000 well, people whatever the sheriff is up there you have monument police you have uh, Palmer Lake police but it's it's really the fire department the emergency responders they go in with uh, it's a it's a medical related call maybe so but it really okay. becomes then a more well of a, at least of a, both of them yeah, you know. it's an assistance visit or call yeah. rather than a real medical emergency in many instances well and I think right. this this all wraps up into the, the same issue that you were just mentioning and I know Phyllis has said it lots of times before the reason why the Tri Lakes Fire Department didn't have seniors on their radar is this is the quietest, most, you know, group of people that they don't make a fuss, they don't demand, they don't, they don't pick it, they don't, they're not the ones who make the phone calls, they're not the ones who make a fuss. We and, are. And so they do <laughs> tend to be um, the, the population that does get overlooked. And so that really is why we are supposed to be the ones to stand up and be able to um, uh, take concerns. notice for them, yep. Um, yep. but not doing services that need to be duplicated. So right. finding out how CARES is doing it, finding out how your group is doing it, finding out how the uh, Drango's group is doing it, so that we don't have to re we we don't have to start from scratch again, right. which is fabulous. But it is that, <clears throat> that's why we need advocates on behalf of our seniors is because they are not the group 
that will stand up and demand that they get the things that they need. And that's just, yeah, that's just the way seniors are. It is. You know, right. They, That's right. The era. The era. Yeah. Well, uh, the it depends. We were, uh, <laughs> no, no, we were taught. Yeah, it's the era. Right. It's You're just right. like they say, oh, you got to go get this physical and that. And then they had it for six months, and I'm not sick. Yeah. Why should I go in? And that's the way they think. Yeah. Yeah. Sure, I'll do it once a year, but I'm not going to go in every six months <clears throat> if there's yeah. nothing wrong. And that's the way they are if they're in a... They'll be dying before yeah. they call anybody. This is the this is seniors, yeah. Mm -hmm. They come, they come at, uh, uh, maybe even out of World War II. You know, <laughs> exactly. They didn't talk about what bothered you. That's right. Any other last minute uh, comments <laughs> when we try to wrap this up? Uh, I'd have a general statement just moving forward. We have actually been granted the ability now to have a brick and mortar location to try to set up a area for seniors to come we are been almost guaranteed quote unquote that was the statement yesterday almost guaranteed an office in the, what is now the Bailey Community Center so Super. that's a really big step it took us it took several months and when I walked in the what room they you? were coming up Chris 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 because I called them 47 times uh -huh. yeah. that's what it took that's to get, what it make takes. that happen that's that voice for seniors that really comes back yeah. through this uh, regional advisory council. All right. Any other comments, questions before we solicit a? Uh, I just get, have a couple of things I want to make everybody aware of. Uh, button. Case. Button. Mike on Mike. Mike. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. So a couple of things coming up just for you to be aware of. You can find information about all these events on the Seniors Blue Book website, seniorsbluebook.com, or you can just let me know and I'm happy to send you information. So there is an affordable um, housing fair at the Senior Center, Colorado Springs Senior Center, April 5th. Um, the Reason to Hope Luncheon uh, for the Alzheimer's Association is April 2nd. Mm, Wendy's doing a CMSA fair, but you need to be a case manager. Um, on the 9th. June 1st is going to be the Senior Expo. Yes, I'm sorry, I was just going through April. Oh, sorry. <laughs> One month at a time here. Um, and then finally, the SRC has their Hengem Awards on the 17th. Oh, and there's a Disability Resource Fair on the 18th. There okay. you go. Can I take a picture of your calendar? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, the, uh, we, I don't think there's anything else on the calendar of events. Our next meeting is scheduled for Fountain Valley Senior Center. Make a note of that. That's on the 25th, the 25th of April at Fountain Valley Senior Center. I'm, I'm just curious, how many people have been to the Fountain Valley Senior Center? Okay, it's a, it's a wonderful place. We kind of, that's one of the reasons we rearranged our schedule is we specifically wanted to get to that location. A lot of services provided there. Okay, so can I have a motion for adjournment? All those in favor? Perfect. We're adjourned.